Hello. Oh. Aloha from the kingdom of Hawaii. <laughs> kingdom. Good to see you all. Hmm. Yeah. You might take a little time to just say hello with your eyes to everyone. Hello, hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> it's such a fun surprise to just get to see everybody. Yay. Yay. Wow. Huh. Wow. Okay. What are you wowing? Oh, I just love to see everybody's faces. It's fun. <laughs> it's like we're still here. That's sort of maybe what I'm <laughs> wowing. <laughs> we're still here. <laughs> <laughs> Alive. Hmm. In spite of the heavenly messengers. Hmm. Side by side with the heavenly messengers. Oops. So just um, if you can again get in touch with your body posture, just bring your awareness to your body posture. Let the attention kind of settle in. Kind of just kind of let the attention glance down the surface of your body or inside. And notice that your body can come to a kind of um, soft, relaxed awareness. Of sitting. Just aware of sitting. And this awareness that can not be lost in experience or identified or caught, this ability to observe and allow experience. It's so important. this awareness that can bring peace moment by moment, or that kind of knee-jerk conditioned reaction where we're not free. So sometimes it's helpful to begin with a, the intention to have this uh, possibility of kindness, care, and tenderness with whatever's appearing. Sometimes even an affectionate awareness. It's a deep intention. It's not only to connect with 
wise, kind attention with whatever's appearing within, but also without the individual karma or kama unfolding and the collective kama unfolding. So letting the attention just softly land with our awareness of hearing, with the kindness and care. This is where we can practice the connecting with just what's happening and sustaining the attention by receiving the sounds, textures, vibrations, silence, coming and going by itself. We see that there can be a tendency to, when we connect, to want to control. So with sound, it can be a great practice of noticing there's nothing we have to do with what is heard, with the sounds, but notice them come and go by themselves. with care for life itself. And so this practice of our kind, caring, non-doing awareness, when we shift to our body, it's remembering that ease of well-being where we're just noticing the physical sensations. Come and go just as they are. Not me, not I, not mine. Our hands can be another great place to let the attention settle in and land. Abide, dwell. with even affection. Gratitude. Sometimes it can seem as we go deeper inside, it can seem like it's more like ours, mine, I. And just, just see what that's like to shift into the movement of the breath and the abdomen. Maybe 
It's just wind, air. Moving. Receiving the life of the breath just as it's happening and disappearing by itself. This practice with sound and body sensation is so important to cultivate every day as it's harder to do with the thoughts, emotion. They can seem even more like mine or I or me, us. The thoughts, they have a texture like sound, like body sensation. Images, black and white color. or sounds of our voices or others' voices. Just like sound, they come and go just as they are, pleasant and pleasant neutral. Not mine, not yours, not ours. The lighter emotions Be lightly happy, bored, compassionate, kind. Joyful. A light sadness or grief, fear, uncertain. Or are these strong, stronger emotions or karmic knots, the intense grief or rage, terror. They're just like the sounds. Or the breath. Not me, not I, not mine. Textures, vibration. 
images, sounds coming and going by themselves. There can be this awareness, free awareness. Observing. Peaceful, kind awareness. With whatever's happening. No need to fix, get rid of, manipulate get anything, a deep respect and reverence, for life itself revealing itself moment by moment.
May we be happy and peaceful of heart. And may we know that things are just as they are. May we care about each other's suffering or suffering. And may we know that things are just as they are. May we appreciate the joy in this world. And may we know that things are just as they are. Can, can everyone hear my voice? Yeah? Great. I've been working with an old yogi doing a self-retreat. Um, on the other side of the planet. And the first few times we've had interviews, did she describes how she helps to create a healthy set and setting. The, the conditions that are suitable for practice, like, reasonably good health, good food, good weather, um, and access to spiritual friends, Kalyanamita, to receive the teachings and be guided by the teachings. The other day she, she showed me what her environment was like I just did a, a spin outside where she does walking meditation. She's surrounded by these mountain pavilions that average 5,000 meters high. And they're just glowing white on the horizon. And framing that is this sapphire, deep blue sky. And that was it, everything else was silence. She's worked out a bit of how to, how to practice uh, in the large compound where she is. There's a number of, of people staying there, including her friend, the, the owner. Um, so she's become, you know, somewhat of a, an enigma. Our silent friend, our friend who's doing a silent retreat. So other people come to visit and though our yogi tries to 
practice quietly and alone, sometimes an excited roommate or friend of hers will introduce her to so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. She's our friend who's doing a silent retreat. And our, so our friend just stays silent and just acknowledges the introduction, doesn't engage. And so she's been growing comfortable with that. And her friends who are just living her life like so many other people do, not particularly aware or having a profound understanding of what Dhamma practice is, what it looks like from the inside, and what it means. Still, they have this res respect for their friend um, doing this silent retreat and these peaceful wakes as she moves along carefully, step by step, and sort of in a in a pattern like patterns in a in a stream, stop and turn and flow back the other way and stop and turn and stream back again. And, and then more uh, relaxed nature walks, um, not the formal back and forth, but still um, a six a six sense door awareness where if you were being observed, it, at some point, people would be aware that she's really taking in everything that's pouring in to her. She described in the most recent interview, the, the feeling of all the phenomena pouring, pouring into her body. Uh, and from the previous interview, um, and talking about how working with visual objects in this in this space that she was trying to make a temple, um, a sacred container, uh, and um, mentioned the difference between when we see and. Um, the mind seems to clamp on to the object of sight. And so it develops immediately this subject object um, dynamic, the seer and the object seen that we talked about, you know, the recognition of that part of the mind that immediately upon the inpouring phenomena of light and particles, uh, the quickness with which the mind proliferates into, a, into an object that has name and form and a, a story around it, often at that point, our identifying thoughts become part of that narrative. And then there's attachment, uh, which is how we identify and stay identified with experience. So this last time she had she had practiced with just the abiding at the seeing sense door as an academic she is you know a strong visual thinker so it was a good exercise and sometimes challenging um, but she had this skill to you know suddenly feel this healthy non attachment it's kind of stepping back and then. In the visual experience, it, it, uh, the, the focus of the scene was not on the object of what was seen, nor was it on the subject, a seer. Rather, it was just abiding in this, in the miracle of, of seeing, the phenomena of, of seeing how the heart mind is able to experience elementally the world within and around us through the recognition of this aspect of the sense door where the scene is just knowing moment to moment the changing color and form. That's the only reality that's happening before 
experience leaps into the conceptual conceptualization of name and form, description, like, dislike, identifying and so forth. So she said, being able to do that, being able to suddenly feel that she was kind of leaning back in this healthy, detached, abiding of seeing without object, without subject, She felt in just taking a breath as if she was breathing in the nectar of metta. As if she was just breathing in the nectar of, of, of metta, loving kindness, while abiding in the awareness, the felt sense of the reality of seeing. And likewise, then we discussed trying it with other sense doors that were easy. Uh, she could come back as much as she wanted to, to the visual sense door abiding there. And because if we master any one of them, they naturally flow over into another sense door. So abiding, for example, abiding with just sound vibration rather than the object of hearing in it being a bird or a cough or um, talking and also letting go the sense of there being a hearer. I am hearing my ear, my sound, all those identifying thoughts falling away and just abiding in the pureness of sound vibration, nothing, doing nothing else, not adding to that, just relaxing with that. And that was a, a huge shift you know, in her practice. And it was at the point where it felt like there was this convergence of different streams coming together, her intention, you know, her creating the, the inner and outer <clears throat> temple, her place of practice, the uh, environment around that, and the internal place of practice, the internal container. That it was you know, just dropping in and like taking such a deep sense of a pure breath and feeling the metta for that breath. She said she noticed other things just recalibrating, like a hip dropping in or shoulder shifting and her head aligning with the spine and nothing she was doing or trying to do. We talked a lot about, you know, doing nothing, getting out of the way and feeling these various currents pick her up and carry it and be the practice for her. And that's exactly what happened. And she looked totally transformed from the previous interview. Um, she can't help overhearing sometimes, though she eats alone and uh, stays to herself and is left alone, um, news of the world leaks in. So she's well aware like all of us are of the intense tragedies going on in the world, the brutality, the violence, thoughtlessness, cruelty, and taking advantage of the weak and the innocent, the young and the refugees, and just so much of that that she's normally tuned into as an aware person, as an academic. Um, but here she would she'd shift in, in a very similar way to how um, in the Phi Thai forest tradition, the senior Western monk, Ajahn Sumedho, uh, spoke to the topic of violence and brutality and criminality in warfare uh, and the reaction that we might have at first of 
anger, revenge, you know, toward the tyrant, toward the per perpetrator of the violence and the, the cruelty and so forth. And how, if we look carefully, that 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 reaction is a is a new is a new comma. It just adds to the suffering in our own heart. In, in addition to how we respond with the anger and the aversion, and and the 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 wanting to to exact some sort of uh, revenge against a perpetrator, a tyrant, a, a group, one group against another, or someone who's uh, a bully and has more power than others. Um, and kind of being there with that, Ajahn, ja, Ajahn Sumedho spoke of, um, we have the choice. We have the choice of not going with on the reactive trajectory where we add suffering to suffering with our own anger and ill will and thoughts of revenge and so forth. Um, rather we could be extraordinarily present and mindful. And that's not putting our head in the sand or um, distracting ourselves with something else. It's, it is actually feeling what's going on. And if we can feel what's going on without feeding off of it, like, you know, that part of us that can be a news junkie and, uh, and therefore it continues to perpetrate that cycle of violence and revenge and anger and, and so forth. Rather, herein, we can, we can decide, we can make the choice of, of not adding suffering to the suffering. Rather, just being present, just being really mindful and When our experience is good, we have a happy feeling, happy feeling in the heart, happy uh, feeling tone in whatever sense experience we're having. And when something is unpleasant, we're aware of that, the unpleasantness that we feel in the body, in the mind, um, in thought formations and so forth. If we can keep it at that level, of just the, the bare attention to the feeling tone and not going into a reactiveness of attachment to what's pleasant, anger, ill will, and um, aggression to what's unpleasant. Though the temptation is strong, it's strong in all of us. How could it not be? You know, we feel for, we want to protect the innocent and uh, the unprotected. Uh, and we often need to make a shelter to grieve the various atrocities, tragedies, horribleness, ugliness that occurs in the world. To really grieve it, we not only need to make a shelter for that pain, for that grief, for that loss, but also from the gratitude that we have in being able to mindfully grieve. Gratitude that we, we can steer away from, from adding suffering to suffering and perpetuating, perpetuating the, the dukkha cycle by just recognizing something is really unpleasant, painfully unpleasant, painful, in the, in the mind and thoughts and emotions, and usually in correlation to that painful body experience, really unpleasant feeling tone with regard to all of that. Really all of the sense doors can be so jarred when we're, when we're face to face with, with such ugliness and such horrendous um, violence and, and the, dehumanization that can be witnessed around us. If we stand in our, within ourselves, if we feel as the student 
did when she started to feel all this phenomena pour into the, her body. She said she, it was like she could recognize and feel the body within the body. Just a profound awareness, a profound wisdom awareness of the body as it is, not as we perceive it, or not as we recognize it through sight, and through sound, but a real deep body sense is what is meant by body within the body and feelings within feelings. That is a deep sense of, of the reality of feeling tone, which arises every moment of experience at all the sixth sense door. Feeling tone is always there. It teaches us radically about the in, nature of impermanence, anicca. So quickly this feeling tone appear and disappear. As well, they, they are uh, entry points, doorways to freedom when we recognize pleasant feeling tone, even very pleasant experience is very different. In fact, in a way opposite of attachment to that pleasantness, to abide in just pleasantness can actually increase the sense of that pleasantness. And it becomes more of an inner Dhamma pleasure when we abide and not add to that pleasantness, uh, attachment, clinging, wanting, holding on. Likewise with extreme unpleasantness, when we are able to let go of the story long enough to feel the extreme unpleasantness of it in the body, in the heart, mental formations, thoughts, and all the ways that we try and want to do something and want to fix something, uh, for the time being, we're just learning how to be with it. And learning how to be with it is being very mindful of our present time experience. So pleasant is just pleasant. It's not attachment to what's pleasant. And unpleasant is just unpleasant. Uh, unhappy mind, uh, unpleasant sensations in the body, in the heart, thoughts. It is not aversion, ill will, aggression, anger. That is the comma. That is, that reaction is a new action that perpetuates the cycle of dukkha and attachment and more dukkha and attachment and so forth. So the, the yogi was in a way kind of acting out the, <clears throat> the advice uh, Ajahn Sumedha was giving 20 some years ago when Yugoslavia was being bombed. And if we just replace that with a current country or a current bad situation closer to home in our own American continent, you can have the same result. And that is when, when we are very mindful, when we're really feeling things as they are in the present moment, the, the one Brahma Vihara heart manifests, manifests effortlessly by nature, not by construction, not by our wish, not by creating it to happen, but rather that's what's there. Compassion is there toward the, those who are suffering so much in these circumstances uh, of being brutalized and violence against them and, and um, uh, great horror, great ugliness, great harm. It's true and it's there. And compassion isn't something that we have to create. It's already in the heart and it just steps out because we're being really mindful. Uh, mindfulness itself is protecting us from the hindrances for the time, for the moments that we're persevering in the mindfulness and it's calling up uh, energy, good energy, Dhamma energy, and it's keeping our awareness, our mental faculties um, unified, gathered together. They begin to converge like many streams rather than scattered and fractured and, um, and split, which can happen 
when we're facing extremely unpleasant uh, experience. If we want to see how the heart is by nature, these Brahma Viharas, um, we can do that just by being mindful. It was impressive and encouraging, uh, inspiring the number of yogis at the retreat that we just taught in British Columbia, Haliha, where we interweave Brahma, all the Brahma Viharya, all the Brahma Viharas, uh, along with the wisdom practice over the two weeks. But I was impressed how many people said that, that they don't need to call up, you know, uh, a phrase or a meta image and, and do practice in those former formal ways that we've all learned ourselves and that we often teach as a teaching tool. That because they've taught it, learned it so well themselves over the years, and, and because we're just doing this sort of one practice with these streams of Brahma Vihara and, and inside awareness weaving together in, into a, a beautiful fabric of moments of crystal clear presence, mindful presence, uh, as well as cleansed sense doors, so that we're seen as it is, hearing as it is, as Michelle was just saying. And you know, fragrance is just fragrance, and taste is just taste, and sensation is just sensation. All of them also can be pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. But that's part of the reality of our human package, meaning it's, it's not a disturbance that we're experiencing hugely pleasant or unpleasant or neutral experience. It's, it's just the truth. So we can be re relaxed with it and usually don't, do not need to try and change anything very radically um, just because it's really unpleasant. There's, there's tools and strategies in which to continue being with that but when we're really mindful of unpleasant, it's okay. Everything is okay. That nothing needs to be done. And if we look, as so many of the yogis, yogis were mentioning, they're just mindful when they look at their heart and they see the Brahma Vihara is already there. The care, the compassion that softens into the beautiful, pleasant experience of caring for pain and suffering. And the loving kindness that's just underlying all connection, feeling goodwill toward all beings and wishing no harm come to living beings. And just like just the slightest little sidewise glance at Murita to understand how easy in already present this wellspring of joy is for wherever there's goodness, wherever there's beauty, wherever there's profound artistic endeavor, there is murita, this dhamma joy. It does not depend on satisfying any of the sense doors. And most importantly, as Michelle ended with, um, the profound composure we all need, especially at times like we've been living through, the recent horrors and just the pain of the pandemic, all the ways things got scattered and space time um, got altered um, and many things were broken. Without the composure of equanimity, how would we, how can we move forward, you know, without resorting to anger, or attachment, without somehow blaming ourselves or being caught by our karmic knots, not understanding them. This yogi I've been working with is 
realizing that a good part of her uh, physical dukkha, of which she has a lot, she's recognizing as a karmic knot uh, in two ways, the physicality of this karmic knot, but also the emotionality of it. She's come to recognize the degree, the weight of anxiety and judgment and shame and embarrassment built around that because that story has begun to fall away. It's when the cracks have, have um, appeared in that tightly net story and, and that the azure or sapphire blue sky light pours into her body or the whites of the 5,000 meter mountains pour into her body. And she feels that peace of just taking one deep breath of metta, nectar. And in that moment, in that breath, in that mindfulness, in that Brahma Vihara heart, for a moment, everything is okay. Everything is beautiful. Everything is just as it is. I'm going to leave it there, and we're happy to take some questions. Ask for further clarification on the things we touched on. Uh, Michelle's guided meditation was brimful of inspiration. Might have questions about where she guided, how she guided us, where she guided us to. Richard, hand up. Hi. Uh, when, I, when I was 17, I had an experience. I was out in the natural world, and I just found myself not distinguishing between myself and the mountains and the lakes around me. I mean, it was just, you know, there wasn't the subject object. And uh, now recently when I, I sort of drop, when I stop fussing about the chores I have to do and just ask myself what is here now, you know, I find that, you know, what is here now is the universe, is everything's here now. And, but I, I just don't know how to, um, what to do that, what to do with all that in the context of, of being aware of, of bodily sensations, for example, or, you know, the sense doors. I mean, it's, it's like a different realm kind of thing. It's not what I, it's not only what I feel, but it's what you feel, right? It's, you know, so I, uh, I, I don't know what to do with it. Well, what, can you say the same thing? Can you ask the same question and take out the I? Well, I, I don't have to do anything, I guess, you know? <laughs> it's, it's just like when you were 17, that spontaneous, deep and profound connectedness with everything and the joy I know you felt from that. That's a good image to, to have as a meditation touchstone, not to chase or not to try and recreate, but that happened because you had all the necessary elements within you they haven't gone anywhere. They're still there. So um, there's some kind of struggle I, I feel going on when you say you don't quite, don't know how to do like uh, with the body sensations and. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's sort of like, um, I, I know you're, it is, I understand it's good to like be aware of what you're, you're hearing and seeing and touching and stuff like that and not be numb to it. Um, but, uh, you know, it, is it interesting? You know, is it, is it, uh, it's so much different than this kind of, it's a, such a, it's a different shtick than just being with everything. 
I don't know. The, that, I can't see the difference. It's all it's all about being alive, isn't it? I have a question. Is this have is this have anything to do with you mentioned chores? And I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering if there's a because of my own experience with chores, um, I feel like a lot of us are conditioned to get them done. And that over time, there's a habit of getting them done in a way that, um, you know, there's the chores. <laughs> and then there's what you're, we're talking about, like that they're separate somehow. And I'm not sure if that's what you were implying. Oh. Oh, Were you I, implying I, that? I, I, I came across this koan, I guess. <laughs> I, I think it's a Zen koan of, you know, if what is here now when there are no problems to solve. Right. And it's the, the, the problems to solve are, is our own, our own life in the world and dealing with other people and getting food and obstacles and all that sort of stuff. So when I just drop down and say, what is here now? It's, it's a different realm kind of thing. I found being injured the last few years really helpful. I'm not recommending getting injured, but um, in terms of like getting through all the daily life stuff and problems, I think um, it forced me to stop a lot. And I have found that annoying, but useful in that once you know once i get over the annoying part of it because my habit is to push through and then to just have to stop a lot the the stopping has been really helpful in regard to what you're saying and i I'm, i really recommend it that we are so conditioned to be getting things done or that somehow if life didn't have the problems then we would they're like obstacles and I think that whole shift um, of bringing that non-doing awareness into the problems and into the chores, I think it's very challenging. I'm not trying to say it isn't. I think that uh, we're so conditioned to, to just, again, not want to be there through that part. Um, I recommend stopping a lot. It's the opposite of what we want to do. You know, the op it's just like the opposite of how we're trained, but by doing it, it undoes the conditioning more, you know, and I, that's all I can say that uh, mm -hmm. sometimes getting old is really good. For the <laughs> no, it is like, it's a, it's a drag, but it's really good because it just, uh, you know, uh, you know, we have a breadfruit tree that it's such a drought that it looks like it's going to kick the bucket. So I, I felt like I, I really felt like I had to at some point drag the hose down there. And it's like over and like all the stuff and it's hard to do. And, you know, I have this injury. And so I got it. I got it down there. And, uh, you know, then you have to go back and turn the water on. Right. <laughs> and then go back down to make sure that it's right. Like going in the right place because often when you turn the water on it the hose jumps and it's not going the water's not going and i just think it's this whole stuff around um in the past i would just like charge through that and now i have to watch every little step i take and stop and uh, it takes so much longer but the other side of it is is that when i'm paying attention it's awesome it's so much better so I, I'm not recommending getting injured, but I am recommending stopping enough so that you cut through the conditioning. Because we're not talking about just that right now. I mean, we're, we're talking about doing that when you look at the news, right? We're talking about it for all of the stuff. It's just like uh, the habit is to say, if this wasn't happening, then I could be mindful or then I'd be okay versus it is happening and we can be okay. Well, know, thank you. Of, yeah. I didn't really hear any struggle with what your experience is, Richard. <laughs> well, maybe I'm not struggling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's okay. Uh, I think maybe it's okay. <laughs> keep, keep that touchstone of your 17 year old. Well, thank you. Yeah. Audrey. 
Hi, thank you. Hi. Um, so I have been, um, this was just a really timely talk because what's been on my mind and heart is um, trying to understand um, the teachings that you guys have been giving about compassion and um, I, I seem to have been be carrying around a teaching about compassion from before that has to do with um, being willing to actually feel that part of our humanity to, to not say this is, I'm sorry, this is happening to you, but just to really tap into how we, we feel these things and to be willing to feel them as a human being to really kind of share and understand what other people are going through. And so um, in the teachings that you guys have been giving, what I've been hearing uh, before tonight had to do with um, the sweetness of caring, that, that you'll know that it's compassion because there's a sweetness of caring. And then tonight, Stephen was talking about um, Uh, tapping into that field and if we're not identifying with it then we can really just feel it for what it is um, I'm just trying to put all that together with this with the the caring part the sweetness part that that if we feel the the suffering if we tap into that um it's painful. And so it doesn't actually feel good. So I'm, I'm trying to put those two things together. I'm not sure if I'm making any sense. Compassion is doing just that, Audrey. It, it's a attunement to, to suffering. Let's just say someone, some being suffering and feeling it as if it's your own. And then an aspect of the compassion is just the wish to alleviate that any way we can from the composure of equanimity and the wisdom of equanimity. In that moment, we know what is the best way to act. Maybe doing nothing, maybe just having caring thoughts because it feels good to care. Or speak soft words, caring words, or helping out physically having enacting compassion in action. So it's kind of like where the, where being in touch with the, the suffering, where that meets care and that just in that spot. I, I think that's, I think what you mean by that is right on. And at the same time, the point of the talk today was we don't have to do anything if we just show up if we just show up care is already there compassion is already there yeah 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 i found that when i was that michelle you're muted michelle we can't hear you no wonder i no wonder. i think i'd just like to offer that there's nuances to this and it's a process so it doesn't stay static so that it could be that we begin with not drowning it like connecting with the pain and feeling the pain sometimes we have to step back and care about it but not be in it and then sometimes we can be back in it and the care is inside that pain do you see what I mean? It's like it's not it's not like a static thing where we just stay in a static place. It's more this that it could be that we go into the pain and it's like, whoa, ow, this hurt this hurts so much. I need to feel compassion for myself, right? And then we're back, then we go back to the other other pain. Do you see? But I think what I'm hearing, which is so wonderful, is that you're bringing that connecting with the pain and caring for the pain sometimes that comes together and which is what I'm Steve is referring to where it's it's just natural there's not an efforting with it but but to remember that it won't stay that way it'll it'll shift back to being more um <laughs> an adventure it's really an adventure compassion practice 
or the pain in the world and how we're relating to it. Yeah. Uh, you were going to say you were going to say something, but I just was oh. trying. Was I didn't know I was muted for so long. <laughs> Another aspect of karuna or compassion that I think is really helpful when when there is suffering and we do have the energy and and courage to move toward it the the compassion itself the the mature karuna brahma vihara isn't afraid of the suffering. Yeah. That's a powerful insight. Yeah. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. That's a good question. I think I'd like to add just one other thing, you know, because it's such a big subject and that sometimes um, in the in relationship to it not staying static, to be careful of judging if you have been having a, a very pure experience of compassion and then it can shift maybe to anger or, you know, feeling defeated by it or that to be very careful of thinking that means you're minimizing the experience that you did have that was very, very pure. So just that we, we, we are finding ourselves in, I think, um, as Steve was referring to, times where uh, it can feel very overwhelming and helpless, the amount of um, shocking, shocking suffering. And... Uh, Maybe it's not surprising if you really understand karma, <laughs> that it's not that surprising, but it's definitely shocking that, that you really have to be careful of um, immersing oneself so much that one is drowning so much that you can't access the equanimity and the compassion. So just, just that recommendation that... Um, if you care these days, if you really care about the pain in the world, and in, um, it can get very tiring if you're not careful of, of actually accessing the Brahma Viharas and the, the practice uh, enough so that you do find th that it, um, you can deepen your practice very, very deeply at this time if, if you're careful. It's a great time to be practicing. For everybody's sake. Yeah. <laughs> But if you hit a place where you're outside throwing rocks <laughs> because it's so upsetting, that's like good practice too. It's okay. Don't, you know, just be careful of having this idea that you're not going like, to kind of hear something and not need to throw rocks <laughs> or something.
Harry? Yeah. Um, it's, it seems like a razor's edge between caring and acceptance, the equanimity and the compassion. And I'm wondering if in the same instant, they can really coexist together or if there's a subtle shift between one and the other really quickly. Yeah. I don't, yeah. They do coexist together. So I sometimes refer to it as, as, as the one mind, the four Brahma Viharas are the one heart or one mind. And then they dance in that more spontaneous, unprompted way, according to experience. The, the connection and wishing well, the friendliness of metta, the response of the heart to dukkha, the response of the heart with, with uh, a, a joyous appreciation with goodness and, and um, beauty and the composure that is uh, uh, threading through it from the beginning to keep them from sliding to their near or far enemies and is itself the carrier of, of the wisdom that helps when prompted to act skillfully together with metta or together with compassion, the wisdom of equanimity, of that steadiness, of that stability, so that the action is, is meaningful. And then that aspect of equanimity that lets go of, of attachment to result. I think understanding that maybe takes the sharpness away from the razor's edge. That, that dance you're talking about Maybe what you're talking about is that if it happens extremely rapidly, like within the get, just the most minute instant of time, they're all together. But it, it seems I know what you, I, I I think I know what you're saying, and I and I. Maybe it doesn't make any difference what particular focus, say my awareness is in a particular just instant that it's, it's, yeah, they're all there and don't try and figure out which one is happening. Just be with that melange, I guess, Some, something. I think that, I think that's very beautiful, you know, that you understand that, like that, that, is how it is, and I, I just, I just want to say there are times when I can feel just compassion, but not equanimity, and there are other times when I can feel equanimity, but not compassion. I mean, there are plenty of times that when that when it comes together in the way that Steve is saying, it's it's not that you can make that happen, but that kind of back and forth that's so invisible, often invisible, and so so quick as um as steve says that's when that when the all four are accessible it's not that they're not ever there but when it's all accessible and in balance um it isn't a time to try to figure it out <laughs> when i can figure it out it means that they're they're kind of far apart <laughs> you, you, even if you think about is that back and forth there has to be a back and a forth it implies a dichotomy and and uh, if i my my sense without thinking about too much is that it it passes understanding it's just that they can all be there together yeah and they're like it's like improvisational jazz and a group of a group of musicians tuning into each other and the music flows from just being together. It's unplanned, unprompted. The same too, but we're, we're not trying to use these Rama Viharas to fix anything or change anything, but quite effortlessly or naturally, they're already there. It, be, almost before we're, oh, how did that happen? 
as you're saying, in an instant. It's the same with the, the uh, uh, awakening factors. As mindfulness builds, the awakening factors are converged into one stream. While we're building those qualities, it is helpful to go through each one and know each one as it is as well. Jazz is an effective metaphor for me. Um, there's a, I, I don't know if the right word is magic, but there's something like that that occurs when this is happening and you just say, holy shit. <laughs> and then, you know, like, how did this, how did these guys all play or? That's right. Yeah. 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 That's like Richard when he was 17. Yeah, exactly. It's a very similar thing. You, it's just, yeah. Thank you. When I was 17. Uh, at least Richard can remember when he was 17. I can <laughs> it's getting it's, it's it's a a mirage. Good. It's like fitting into the pit. He, he, he like, didn't say he could remember anything else. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Carol. You have to unmute. I wanna say how appreciative I am about all of the teachings in the last few years. I've been pretty cloistered in this little world. And today I was uh, driving to the ferry and going slightly under the speed limit which I found sometimes in uh, meditation retreats I, I, that happens. Anyway, I was pretty calm and I was following a truck up a hill uh, and the truck hit a deer. And the deer, you know, from when I was aware of it, uh, sort of flipped up in the air, uh, body became contorted. And I was on my way to the ferry and somehow it ran off, which amazed me that it could. And so the car, the truck pulled off. And again, I was on, on the way to the ferry, but I thought, no, I need to stop because, you know, I was the witness to this. So I, I stopped and, and as I was pulling over, a fawn just ran across, which I didn't hit. You know, I just uh, saw it. But what struck me was the caring for the deer, the caring for these people that hit the deer. They were so upset. And I wanted to give them my information so that in case they have any problems, um, you know, that they'd have my information as a witness. Uh, the man was very distracted. The woman was completely shaken. Uh, and they were having trouble even getting the information. So I said, uh, you know, I can type it into your phone for you. <laughs> um, but what amazed me was the feeling of caring for them, uh, caring for the deer. And the fact that I was calm going into this. And then I proceeded onto the ferry and met with family of which, you know, I haven't done a lot of these things because of COVID. And it was so lovely, you know, again, it was what's happening in each of their lives and uh, it was beautiful. And with gas prices, it was amazing too that how many people like me were just walking on the ferry. You know, there are hundreds of people now that are walking on the ferry instead of driving. So it was, and then it's this witnessing of what's happening in Ukraine and Texas. And it's like being on all these different planes, I guess that would be, it doesn't feel like, it just feels, I just feel a real appreciation for what you've been teaching us because somehow it just, it opens up the world or opens up how I feel about things. Anyway, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. 
that's such a good example of um, what we can offer in a situation like you described, you know, I mean, just like what you can offer if you have all these tools to, to the deer, including the deer, you know. Well, it's true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. To the, it's true. yeah to, and to I the really deer. appreciate it. Um, what you've been sharing for these last couple of years on Zoom and in person. You know, I feel very fortunate. Thank you. You're welcome. The other thing I just want to say is that that sense of um, things opening up is that it's the opposite of resistance, right? The resistance to pain versus the attention can allow or see if, if we're connecting and it's too painful that you can have this really different tools of care, meta, right? Like mindfulness and et cetera, but just like that description of many planes of existence happening, that's the truth. And you're, you're getting more and more aware and open to all these different levels. And it's, um, it's heartening for Steve and Jesse and I to also hear from you about it. It's wonderful to hear. So we know that means you're practicing. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> You've been showing up, Carol. I show up and I'm very happy to be able to show up. <laughs> Can I make a little announcement that's related to <laughs> showing up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, just this thing about the last couple of years, uh, the um we have had you know because we've been doing all these programs online we have a ton of recorded material and um kim allman who just signed off a little while ago um made a donation a couple months ago to help us uh put an app together that's just recordings of our instructions and our talks and stuff like that over the last couple of years so it's finally finished and i was actually waiting for it just today there's two versions of it. There's the iPhone version and then the Android version. That one hadn't been finished until today. So I'll send out an email announcement um, today or tomorrow to let people know, but they're out there. So you can look at, I'll, I'll put a little, I'll put the links here, but you don't need them. You can just, um, this is the Apple store one and then the, the Google store one. But um, anyway, of course they're free and it's just like, everything you hear us saying uh, in your regular times, but, it, but it's nice that we have them now and they're, you know, it can be kind of more freely shared and, um, you know, it might be a time where we can, whatever we think of new ways of using this sort of um, piece of technology as well. But um, you can just Google Vipassana Hawaii in the app store or, or search for it in the, the Google Play Store and uh download that so just so it's a wonderful gift we're very excited about it and um and like i said we'll send an email out soon but it does feel like this ability to be showing up is amazing you know over these last couple of years and we're so joyous about it and and excited to keep going keep continuing um but also as we integrate our in-person stuff you know these next seasons there's uh, a retreat coming up next month an online retreat in June is coming up. So, yeah, I put one announcement. I'll I'll include another announcement about that retreat coming out, and it starts just in under two weeks. Um, plenty of options of ways to participate, depending Start, on. Starts on King Kamehameha Day, <laughs> and also I just think you might find it you might find it interesting that um, who Jesse found to work on the Vipassana Hawaii app are uh, the people who worked on it are in Ukraine. They're Ukrainian. Yeah. And so that also had an extra, um, very heartfelt, teary, wonderful um, aspect to uh, that wasn't planned, but that we're, ha we, we got them involved before the war started. So, um, it's been, they've been still actually able to work on it. So that's kind of also a good feeling. Yeah, it was quite amazing. And that was like Michelle said, just by chance, the, the main office is in Los Angeles, but 
his friends and colleagues that he works with are mostly in, in Lviv, or I don't know quite how you say it. Um, Lviv, I think Lviv. Yeah. L V I V. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we said, you know, this was in February. We we're like, wow, if you guys need, obviously, pause on this. And they said, no, they wanted to keep working on it. So they did. And they said they were making Molotov cocktails in their after hours of working on our meditation. <laughs> so something to think about. <laughs> what a world. So many levels. Hmm. One more, Becca. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you for all of these this offering tonight. Um, you know, so, so many things. Um, this just a few days ago really was uh, experiencing a lot of grief around particularly the recent tragedies um, that you have all been speaking of this evening. And <laughs> it's a beautiful reminder to be here because I had the good fortune of, on one hand, I felt like it wasn't really a choice. On the other hand, I had the good fortune of sort of being able to clear my schedule and allow the space for the grief that was moving through my experience on Friday specifically, and um, just feel very reminded of what was with me, which was the Brahma Viharas somewhat formally and somewhat informally. And I'm feeling very um, comforted because Friday and Saturday, like the equanimity piece, you know, things are as they are with that and, and feeling quite alone. Uh, so it's um, just beautiful <laughs> to be reminded that there are others <laughs> and that are able to hold that space. There's a lot of other energies. Um, so thank you. The cheers are so important. It's important for all of us. I'm uh, grateful to have the tools. <laughs> well, this is, yeah, it's, if we don't have these, it's, it's unimaginable not to have these tools. I think you get to see the, the beings who don't have the tools, what happens? It's so, so, so intense. And yes, as Harry has written, you're not alone, you know, and uh, so many of us are trying so hard to hold this, hold this well. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Mm -mm. To, to even, for me, I'm just noticing I don't even want to step into how unimaginably sad it really is in terms of the detail. We just, we all know, we just all know. And that's mm -hmm. important to, um, it's really respecting, respecting the, um, the grief and the horror of it. It's just so important, to, as Steve was saying, to, to be with and to be with mindfully and to be with, with the Brahma Viharas. It's like, mm -hmm. that's how you respect it and hold it. Mm -hmm. So, and with all of us doing that, you can feel the strength of that and the power of it and, and the importance of it. It's almost like we have to relentlessly hold it. 
Yeah. Yeah. So true. And I, um, I've been putting out newsletter for my, for clients that I work with and folks in my community. And it was slotted for like a regular update, you know, of like events that are coming. And I just couldn't send, couldn't send that. And so I wrote something along these lines without using the the words of the Brahma Viharas, but I'm inspired to bring that in more essentially in other languaging, inviting people to recognize and validate and honor their experience, you know? And so in a way it was an invitation of holding that space. And I was feeling the challenge of that and shared that and then almost feeling the risk, I think, you know, because the, there can be such disagreement or um, lack of understanding around that and yet not, right? Here's a whole community and so many people that can understand. And uh, so I appreciate that a lot. We, we also have to hold that way that there's so much disagreement now as well. And I think that's maybe the hardest part to hold of it all. Mm -hmm. So good job. Good that you are working with it. Yeah. You can't always respond perfectly. Just be careful of that. Like if you get some flack, it, it means you put it out there. It's better you put it out there. Mm -hmm. Ah, it's so good to be with everybody. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just keep Brahma viharing each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As Harry said, we're not alone. Yeah, very important. That's why we do this. So hang in there. <laughs> See you next Sunday. <laughs> hmm. Hmm.